Expanding Rubber. Today we're going to cover the basic use and methods for molding an expanding rubber part. Now the first step will be to cast some expanding rubber. Now this is a new product we just added that uh, allows you to make an enlargement from an existing mold uh, chemically rather than actually having to enlarge it through mathematics or using a 3D printer or anything like that. So what we're going to do is first mix up some expanding rubber and what this is, this is a urethane rubber and it's formulated so uh, once you mix this up and pour it into a mold you soak it in water to grow it, kind of like those little kids toys like little dinosaurs and things. Now the expanding rubber formula is mixed one to one by weight. And uh, you could probably mix it by volume too, I haven't tried that yet, but uh, weight ratio is always more accurate. And what we're doing here is mixing up about 150 grams of A and 150 grams of B. And the expanding rubber has a working time of about 10 to 15 minutes and then a demold time of overnight or about 16 hours. And you can speed that up with heat, but ideally it's best to pour that at room temperature and then let that cure overnight. And once you mix this up, it has the consistency of uh, some of our urethane rubbers like 7560 or 7559. And as with any uh, rubber formula with an A-B mix like this, you want to make sure you take care to scrape the sides and the bottom of the container. The part A is considerably thicker than the part B, so you want to take care to really mix that up well and uh, take a good 45 seconds to a minute to really get thorough mix on that, uh, the two ingredients there. Now once we've mixed that up, we're ready to pour it into a silicone mold. And this works well in both uh, tin cure and platinum silicone molds. Here we have a test mold here we use in our shop uh, of a 7111 mold of a 3D printed ear. And later on you're going to see the lines on that 3D printed ear uh, get a lot bigger because it takes all that detail and expands it accordingly. Now one of the nice things about a 7111 mold, this is a very soft silicone, very pliable, so it allows us to squeeze it a little bit and help evacuate any air bubbles that might be trapped in the mold. Now once we've poured our cast there, we're going to let that sit overnight. And this particular one we rushed just a little bit because I was eager to play with it and uh, get it in some water and soak it. But uh, once you demold that part, you're ready to soak it in water. And here I filled up a Rubbermaid tub with uh, just some clean water, clean tap water, and ready to soak our part. And a part like this will take a couple of days to expand completely. And I'm going to show a little bit of that process here. We'll show you what it looks like after about an hour. You'll see it start to change color, and you can see it starting to absorb the water. And when it starts reacting and absorbing water, it's going to do that depending on the cross section. It's going to look kind of funky for a little bit as it goes through those stages, but eventually it will all level out and you'll wind up with a part that is evenly expanded. And for parts with a really thick cross section, those may take more time and you might even have to poke holes in them. So uh, remember that when you're casting up parts. Thinner cross section parts respond to this process much better than thicker cross section parts. Now ready to dry off our part and make a mold. Now mold making over a rubber part like this is really tricky because since this is a wet part, since this is absorbed water, it's very low density and it has the consistency of uh, like uh, jello. So we want to take care to mold this to not distort it. We can't make a dump mold by just dumping rubber over the top because since it is so low density it's going to try to float. So I'm uh, just placing this on a piece of foam core and then we're going to spray a light spray of release. This is just some 2500 spray release. And what we're going to do, we can't secure it because the part is wet. And once you remove it from the water, you want to mold it pretty fast because it is wet. And when, it, when that water dries out, the part will start to shrink. So we got to move fast here. And that's one of the reasons we're using Gel 25 to make the negative mold. Gel 25 is mixed one to one by weight or volume. And one of the nice things with Gel 25 is it's not uh, inhibited by the uh, urethane surface. Some uh, silicones might be inhibited by that urethane rubber that we're molding. Now Gel 25 is also fast and that's going to help us immensely with this kind of mold over a wet part that we don't want drying out before we complete the mold making process. 
So uh, Gel 25 has a five minute working time and then a one hour demold, which is perfect for this type of part. Now here I'm mixing up my Gel 25. I'm just mixing up a couple of ounces. I think we mixed up maybe about 20 grams or so. And uh, we're putting in a little bit of red pigment in this. This is some red silicone pigment and no thickener. And the steps we're going to show here are real important to molding a part like this because when you have a part that basically has the consistency of jello, there's a lot of little nuances to making a successful mold over that part since it, it can't really be molded in a traditional way. So what we're going to do is this initial coat will actually help to stabilize this part for the rest of the molding process. And that's one of the reasons we're using gel 25 and not say gel 10. We don't want the rubber to be too soft uh, because we don't want it to distort. So gel 25 has a firmness of a Shore A25 and that will actually help stiffen up this part a little bit when we add additional layers onto the mold. So our first layer here is going to do two things. It's going to stabilize the part and help secure it to the base and it's also going to provide our detail coat or what we refer to as a print coat that captures all of that surface detail. Now you'll notice like uh, many of our other mold videos, we're making a uh, flange around the base of the part of about an inch to an inch and a half. Now with gel 25 working at room temperature, you'll be able to put a layer on of uh, fresh rubber on about every 15 minutes. So now we're ready to move on to our second layer. In our second layer, we're going to mix up the same. We just need a small amount of gel 25 mixed up here. We've measured about double that original batch, about uh, 50 grams of A and 50 grams of B. And now we're adding a little bit of silicone pigment and some 10 thick thickener. And uh, we're just adding a little squirt of that, just what amounts to about a gram, if that. And this time we're adding white silicone pigment. And this is more for your sake than anything else. So you can see how that different coat is going on over that original red layer. Now by adding the tin thick thickener, that converts gel 25 from a flowing liquid to a thixotropic paste. So what we have now is a gel consistency. And if you've watched some of our other videos, you're familiar with this process. But that gel consistency is important on this type of part with a lot of uh, deep and complicated undercuts to help us fill those areas in. We can basically pack that into those undercut areas. Now as a side note, if you're working on a part with a whole lot of surface detail like this and you're concerned about trapping air bubbles in that surface detail, you can actually do several coats like we did with that first gel 25 coat with no thickener and gradually build up that thickness that way and that way you don't have any air entrapment on the surface. Here we wanted to move along fairly quick so we did our initial print coat with no thickener and then you'll see I'm just packing that thickened gel 25 in that deep undercut behind the ear and uh, just filling that in and what we want to do is simplify that shape to basically look like a little uh, uh, cake there, uh, almost like a little layer cake where we uh, just have a flat top to it and the sides slightly drafted so it'll come out of a mother mold easily. Now I get a lot of questions about uh, this part of the process. People ask, well, how many layers do I need to put on to uh, to make a good mold. And you really don't want to think, when you're doing a brush on molds, you really don't want to think of that in terms of how many layers as much as you want to think about the overall thickness. Uh, here it's real important that we simplify that form and fill those undercuts. But Gel 25 is a very strong rubber, so a quarter inch thickness is fine for this. So if you can achieve that quarter inch thickness to say three eighths inch thickness, if you can achieve that in one layer, fine then uh, you could do that in one layer. Uh, but typically for a mold like this, three layers built up, gradually thickening that up is adequate to build up a good mold. But you want to focus more on that final thickness than you do on how many layers you're putting on. Now this is our final layer and we've gone back to red pigment here. And again, we've added tin thick thickener to uh, make this again a thixotropic paste and we're doing the same thing here. Now we can brush a little bit more aggressively since uh, the gel 25 is helping that ear hold its form. So now our shape is stabilized and we can build up the rest of the mold. And here you'll notice once we brush this on, since this is our final coat, I want that outside to be as smooth as possible. So once I get that all brushed on, I'm going to switch over to a popsicle stick. Or you could also use an artist's palette knife. But we want to use something that we can trowel up the sides and, and make it as even and smooth as possible. 
And again, remember that your working time is five minutes, so you want to move quick. And once you've uh, applied that final coat, you're ready to allow it to cure for an hour before you put on that mother mold. Now, once that final layer has cured, we're just going to make some quick registration keys just by cutting some notches in the rubber. Now, you can do uh, much more elaborate keys, as you might have seen in our other videos where we do the little pre-poured uh, little nibs that are stuck on the outside of the mold. Um, but in this case, just for the sake of time, we're just going to make these little V-shaped notches, and that will help us realign this in the mold. Because since we've simplified that form, we want to make sure that we know which way this goes later on. And once we do that, we're ready for our plaster banded shell. Now we opted for a plaster banded shell for the sake of speed because we can make a really fast shell uh, with plaster bandages and it holds up well for uh, a reasonable you know, production and use in a shop. So I'm just going to Vaseline that board. I'm just putting a little bit of petroleum jelly around the base. And that is mainly for the sake of keeping those plaster bandages uh, from grabbing onto that foam core later on and just easing the entire demold process. And since you've probably seen this before, we're not going to linger on this too much. Here's a, a fast version of the mother mold process. Basically, we're just activating those bandages by dipping those in warm water and putting them on the form. And one of the reasons we like to do this process at our shop is it is fast and simple and you can have a mold ready to cast into within an hour. And it's also cheap. A mother mold like this costs about three bucks. So uh, that's always nice when we can make a, an entire mold. This entire mold uh, is, was probably about ten dollars. So that's a, a very inexpensive process and typically a mold like this we're going to use mainly to reproduce like a clay pattern. Uh, but in this case what we're going to do is once it's cured we're going to pull it off the base and make a quick resin cast. And it's real important since you just molded a wet part. And you'll see here that if we're careful, we can remove this and preserve that pattern. But since that pattern is wet and full of water, then uh, that some of that moisture will transfer into our mold and will contaminate the inside of our mold for urethane casting. So make sure before you cast your resin parts into this mold uh, that you use a hair dryer or a paper towel or something to dry out the inside of that mold really well. Otherwise, when you go to pour your resin, your first cast is going to come out full of air bubbles from where it reacted with the ambient moisture in that mold. And now we have our mold ready for casting. So you can see here we've uh, seeded it back into the plaster banded shell. And since this is a gel 25 silicone mold, we can pour Easy Flow 60 resin into this without any mold release. So that makes painting later on much easier. And a quick overview of the resin casting process. Uh, Easy Flow 60, you have about a two and a half minute pour time, and then about a 10 to 15 minute demold, depending on the cross section of the part. And there is our finished part. We're ready to demold it and compare it to the original. And the beauty of this process uh, allows you to enlarge a lot of things. This is a really handy rubber. The expanding rubber is really handy for uh, museums and display companies and, uh, and medical companies. Anyone that is expanding an existing part of human anatomy or anything like that that you want to use as an example for a display or trade show or anything like that. So now you can see our final cast next to our original cast, and you can definitely make out those 3D print lines. And most of the time, you'll be using this process uh, more, more than likely to produce a clay positive that could be re-sculpted, rather than actually use that as a finished production mold. So remember that, that uh, a lot of times this uh, expanding rubber is going to be used as a tool just to create another clay positive that could be fine-tuned and remolded. And of course, uh, as with all of our videos, all of the supplies shown herein are available on our web store at brickintheyard.com.